the world has completely changed over the last two years. We have shifted from a physical interactive world to something that has become very contactless, digital and remote. And there are companies that are trying to adopt this new way of working and interacting with customers. And that has caused so much of stress and anxiety for them. In addition to that, most of the remote uh, workforce is now remote and they are not just working from home, but they also have their loved ones. They have their children attending schools. They have their pets. They have so many other things. They have life going on around them. And that's why it's not work from home, but it's actually existence from home. And with so much of stress and anxiety within our lives, we need empathy. I'm Gautam Palapa, and I'm an executive advisor at VMware, where I focus on business transformations for enterprises that are trying to convert to a contactless digital and a remote world. Today, I am extremely excited and happy to talk about empathy, which is a huge passionate topic of mine. I've been working in the industry for a very for more, over 15 years, and empathy is at the core of everything that I do. And I'm really happy today to be sharing some of my thoughts about empathy and also how we can make empathy a part or a core tenet of your enterprise. I'm going to share Project Athena, which was one of the projects that I kickstarted and I drove for, for a couple of months in an organization and I will share the results and the things that came out of it. And one of the things that I'm gonna share is how we crowdsourced empathy with through Project Athena. And I will also give you suggestions and tools and tips on how you can rethink and reimagine your current processes and how you can transform your organizations and make empathy part of your core tenet. So let's get started. First, I would like to start off by level setting and defining empathy because empathy is a huge umbrella term and it means different things to different people. So at its core, empathy is love and understanding for your human beings. And when we reach out to people and make sure that they are, we are all collectively working together and we are being happy, we are uh, exhibiting empathy. In an enterprise setting, Empathy is the ability to step into someone's role, look at things from their point of view, and understand why a particular action was taken or why a decision was made. And that is the core of empathy in an enterprise. But all empathy is not the same. There are actually different types of empathy. The first type of empathy is cognitive empathy. And this is something that is the most common type. It's the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes and try to think or feel what they might be feeling. This kind of empathy doesn't require any kind of uh, emotional engagement. It's a very rational and independent approach. And a lot of people who are in a, who, a negotiating role or who are sales executives or maybe in the field or executive leaders are very, very prone to using cognitive empathy in their day-to-day -day life. The next one is emotional empathy. And this is where you are able to share your feelings and have a deeper understanding with someone else. It creates that genuine connection with someone. So for example, team leadership is a really good example of um, emotional empathy. The third one is compassionate empathy. And this is the most active form of empathy because this not only allows one to be concerned and uh, allow them to experience emotional pain, but also to take practical steps to reduce that pain for the other person. And that's why it's also called as effective empathy. Mentoring is a really good example of this. So when it comes to me, and I'm very passionate about empathy, and I have a book coming out actually um, late summer, which is called Leading with Empathy, where I touch upon all the various ways in which Empathy can influence leadership and how it can transform organizations. But for me, my guiding principle for empathy is that when I can look at a human being and I can put myself in their shoes, if I can understand the pain and the stress that they're going through, and this is the most important part, if I can value their happiness above my own and do something about their pain, that's when I really feel I'm empathic. 
So as you can see, I lean more towards the compassionate empathy um, portion of, uh, of demonstrating empathy. And all the actions and the various experiments that I've done with empathy are more aligned towards compassionate empathy. So here are some basic um, benefits of empathy. When you have empathy, you have trust and respect. When you have trust and respect within your teams, you have team bonding, you have collaboration, you have communication. And as a result of that, your psychological safety increases. And when people feel really safe, they're able to take risks. And when they take risks, they can experiment better and they're comfortable with failure. And so their innovation increases. And that overall breaks down the silos. There is no us versus them. And this causes a positive culture for the organization. And eventually you get happy humans and that's what we want. So today I'm gonna to be talking about how to crowdsource empathy and how we actually transformed an organization using empathy at the, as the core tenet, but also using lean, agile and DevOps practices. So here's the situation that we had. Um, I was leading a engineering organization. Um, it was a fairly large organization and we had a very suboptimal SDLC. So for example, if we were not in the product management realm or in that particular department, we were not actually allowed to ideate. And any ideas that we gave were just put you know, on the back burner. It took around 35 days on average for requirements and design to actually come back to the development and the testing teams. And this was like after um, interactions with the customer and going back and forth. And there was a considerable waste there. From a dev test perspective, there was a constant friction between them. Um, it was an us versus them mentality. Devs would just throw something over the wall and expect the de testers to test. Um, and then whenever testers would open bugs, the devs would just say, works as, works as designed or works on my laptop. I don't know what the problem is. And so there's a constant friction that's going on over there. And then in after it passed all those various things, we had the change advisory board. We had manual oversight committees where we had to assign our names to every single release. So if something went bump or something went wrong, it gave in the concept of one throat to choke. And deployment was a nightmare. It was like deployment Tetris. We had to figure out what to slot in where, the environment was considerably brittle and there, eventually, there invariably were a lot of breaks. This entire SDLC process from IDA to go live on average was taking us 183 days and that was considerably um, huge. Just imagine today in, in this way of working, if it takes us 183 days to release a feature, uh, we would lose all our customers. So this was not a really good state. In addition to that, we had high attrition. Because of all these pressures and because of all these various um, interactions and, and um, undercurrents within the organization, we had high attrition of up to 42% in some departments. We had a very low ENPS score. Uh, when I took over this entire organization, um, I, I, my first step was to do an enterprise NPS survey and we had a minus 18, which was extremely low. There was hardly any automation. Uh, I want to say that maybe we had 15% of, uh, of the SDLC automated in some way, shape or form. And then the code was extremely unstable. We had at least one sub bomb <clears throat> per week. And because of that, we had constant executive oversight. Uh, deployments were always on Friday nights. And so if something went bump, that meant that there was no weekend for all of us. We had to have all hands on deck. And that was the mentality within that organization. So it had to change. The organization, and this comes from Ron Westrom's uh, typology of, uh, of organization, organizational culture. Um, it was pretty much a pathological organization. It was more power oriented. And there were pockets where it was rule oriented or it was bureaucratic. And there was some cooperation, but there was not a lot. And so the goal was to shift to a generative organization or a performance oriented organization. And that was what I was tasked to do. I wanna share two of my fundamental beliefs. My first belief is that happy people are productive people. So everything that I do 
is focused on making sure that my people are happy. My next belief is that strategic disruption leads to progress. It's not disruption for the sake of disruption, but you want to be very strategic about what you are introducing into your environment that will lead to progress. And these are my two fundamental beliefs and these are my guideposts that I've used throughout um, to help transform organizations. So the first thing that I did was I talked to my managers and I said, we need to have a work-life balance. We're having too much of um, un unplanned work. And so I, I sent a memo to everyone and I said that there is no weekend work or overtime work without my approval. And the approval has to be given through the directors of the organization where they had to justify why this overtime or this weekend work was needed. But what I was trying to do was trying to get the patterns or trying to see if there's a, there was any reasoning as to why we were working so much of overtime. The next thing is we did a value stream map and this is a very lean process, right? We take a look at the entire flow of value within the organization. We do process analysis and, flow, and uh, look at how we can modernize the process. But this is slow and it takes time. But this was the very important step for visibility and for understanding how value is being transformed within the organization and where waste is. And so this is an important step for us. And then afterwards, the third most important thing was I wanted to make sure that we were going to increase psychological safety. We wanted to embrace failure. We wanted to change the mindset of the leadership. We wanted to bring in trust and collaboration and innovation and start moving towards a generative culture. So I kicked off Project Athena. Project Athena, um, I named it after the Greek goddess of war, handicraft and practical reason. And it seemed very befitting for the situation that we were in and where what we were embarking on. So we wanted to have a war on process overhead. So we wanted to ready, eliminate waste, um, increase the automation footprint, reduce the manual toil and modernize the flow. So as you can see, it's all lean, agile and, and DevOps concepts. The next thing I wanted to do is since I wanted to also perform a cultural transformation or an organizational transformation, I wanted to crowdsource empathy to improve that collaboration and reduce the friction and treat people as people, right? And provide and improve that psychological safety that they have, which brings and gives that better culture so that people can embrace failure, they can fail fast, fail often and fail cheap. They can innovate. We can change the executive mindset and move towards that generative organization that we were aspiring for. The first thing I did was I trained everyone on lean agile and DevOps. Um, it was mandatory. So lean experimentation was going to be the one of the one of the fundamental pillars that we were going to use, especially the build, measure, learn, and feedback loops. Then we train them on agile practices. So pair programming, TDD, cloud native approaches uh, were something that I drove within the organization. And this was for all, everyone within the org. It was not limited to just the devs and the, test, uh, and the testers. And then finally, a DevOps mindset. We wanted to bring in that uh, operational efficiency, CICD and automation. And so taught them about um, DevOps as well. Next, we wanted to bring that executive visibility, right? We wanted to change the mindset. So um, I identified a prime location, which was just outside the elevators. Um, um, on the left side were the offices of the executives. And on the right side, we had a couple of other glass walls. And I, I, I commandeered those glass walls. I created all the stickies and created a large Kanban board. We had a progress meter, which was going to show how much of uh, value we were adding through this particular project. And we had an open backlog. We said that anyone could add to the backlog as long as they were able to collaborate. We must have at least two people working on a particular card. We identified themes based upon surveys on where we had the most lift or where we could build the momentum. And then we hired a card layout, which had the hypothesis, um, how much of time could be saved by executing this. We had a definition of done, and we had a measure of success for each of these um, cards. And I mandated that at least one manual process had to be automated by this through this particular card process. 
And so we built the backlog. We used to have um, a, a weekly standup. Um, we used to celebrate successes and wins, and they used to move through the cards. It was pretty simple. It was to do, doing, and done. We vote upon the things that would be um, flagged as to do within that particular iteration. And we kept the iterations really small. Uh, none of the cards were gonna be more than um, two to four weeks. So two iterations. And we started moving them. And every time we had a success, we would, we would celebrate. We would celebrate loudly. A lot of executives started getting curious about all these cards. They stopped by and they started looking at it. And that actually increased that viral marketing. And people started cheering for this. Now, most of the cards that we identified were actually pains and pain points that people were suffering from and they wanted to get rid of. Others wanted to collaborate with them because they felt empathetic to the people who were suffering with that. And they wanted to help improve the quality of life of people within the organization. And so we had this entire framework in which we started to crowdsource empathy. People started identifying things that really rubbed them the wrong way and they wanted to kill it. And that became a card and that became a hypothesis. And then we started voting and started working on these things. And it was a wonderful project that we undertook. We also failed in a number of cards and it was okay. But what I wanted to signal to people was that failure of one team is validated learning for an entire organization. So every card that failed, we would actually have a retro and share why that particular card failed. We started really slow. The first round was just one card, but it was a card where a daily test summary report had to be generated. So for those of you who know how this is done, it is always at the end of the day. And that is the only report that prevents you from going home and spending quality time with your, with your, with your family or your loved ones. Uh, now it is just you move away from wherever you're working to the place where your loved ones are um, interacting so that you can, you can have downtime and you can enjoy um, a quality of life. It used to take them one hour per test lead and they were able to automate this particular test summary report by connecting it to the test management systems, creating reports, creating charts, and they reduced it to a button click almost. Um, the only thing that the lead had to enter was their um, thoughts or their insights about what happened during the day. And everything else was pretty much auto-populated. And this was great. It was really, really exciting and encouraging. It saved so much of time for all the test leads. Now they could go home a little earlier they could, uh, or they could spend more time with their loved ones. And this was great. And that started picking up. The story started sharing. People started learning about this. They started actually feeling the benefits of it. And then uh, that juggernaut uh, or the momentum started rolling. And then it just picked up speed and became that juggernaut. It was a huge success. We ran it for three quarters. Um, overall, 46 idea cards were, um, were run through Project Athena with an average of 2.3 collaborators per idea. We saved over 9.34 hours per person per week. And that was great because now I could actually bring in that 80-20 rule where uh, Fridays was actually dedicated to anything innovative. And that increased and added momentum and started driving much more um, success to this, this project and started improving people's quality of life. People started feeling happier. They were more excited. They were much more innovative and they were able to collaborate better. And that was really great. We did a lot of fun things. Um, for example, we played golf with some decommissioned, uh, decommissioned servers. I uh, booked a conference room for an entire afternoon. Uh, we, we created a par four putting uh, golf course with these decommissioned servers and we had lots of fun. Uh, we took some of the decommissioned servers that we, when we were moving data centers, uh, we took them over to a farm and we blew them up with Tannerite and had a barbecue and lots, lots of fun. There was a particular uh, framework that was really causing us a lot of pain. We um, 
we assigned a team to it. They they broke every single record and made phenomenal progress on that one. And so um, I took them to a cigar bar and I opened a uh, seven thousand dollar bottle of bourbon and we smoked cigars and talked about all the various things that happened and how we enjoyed it and it was great. So we had we had lots of fun. We started becoming much more positive. We started becoming much more collaborative. We were much more relaxed. We had less stress and we were happier. So before, as I said, it was taking 183 days from concept to consumption, 15% um, automation. Um, the mindset over there were about, was that, you know, 100% uptime, zero defects and failure is not an option, right? Um, that's something not sustainable. <clears throat> We had up to 42% attrition in some of the teams and an ENPS of minus 18. But after we ran it, our concept to consumption just through Project Athena, it went down to 21 days. It was phenomenal. Um, we had over 87% automation with it. Um, our number of incidents reduced. We were able to roll back or roll forward really quickly. Our attrition went down to 6.4%. I had people who had quit learn about these things through their friends and want to come back. And they joined us and that was a really proud moment for me. We had so much of psychological safety and innovation. We were able to embrace the failures. It was really great. And then um, uh, after three quarters, we took the ENPS score and our ENPS score went to 35 plus 35. And after that, I had to move to a different role. But what I've heard is that Project Athena continued and it still has so many fun stories um, that, that uh, you know, it's really, really great that we were able to crowdsource empathy. But not only that, we were able to rethink and reimagine the way that we approach problem solving or the way that we deconstruct a problem and not go through a traditional mechanism. And that is one of the core things. You want to make sure that anything that you do is to, is to improve the quality of life of people and make them happier. And you want to empathize with them and you want to reduce their pain. You want to do something tangible that will reduce their pain. And that is something that really helps. I want to share another story, um, which is more around rethinking and reimagining. Um, this is Performance testing, which is really painful, especially when you have a new flagship product a platform that you want to um, deploy and have your mission critical apps on. And we wanted to do something different. We wanted to rethink and reimagine the way that we tackle this. And so this is a story of how I fondly want to think of where we hardly slept for 48 hours. We pushed people to learn new things and we ate a lot of pie. So here's the problem. We were on a cloud journey and we had adopted a particular platform that is Tanzo Application Service for the hybrid cloud strategy. Now that was the flagship product. And so we had to perform every kind of test on it. So load, stress, soak, spike, duty cycle, you name it, we had to do it. And if we were to do it in the normal way, it would have taken a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, it would have taken four to six months if we went the traditional route. And this was not acceptable. We wanted to find a different way. So we wanted to rethink and reimagine the way that we, we attack this problem. So brainstorming upon, uh, um, with, with my teams, I said, how about we just crowdsource this? Have a hackathon. And we said, okay, let's do it. And thus we had the Pi Day Hackathon. It was on March 12th and it would end on March 14th, which was Pi Day, which was, which is in my mind, the one of the nerdiest days um, ever. It was 48 hours of intense coding. We decided to open it up to everyone. Any bold idea, as long as it was legal, we wanted to improve that collaboration and we wanted to allow people to fail uh, um, fast, often and cheap. And so we said that there had to be a team of three or four. They had to demonstrate working software we wanted to push people a little more. And so we said that they must create a video showcasing the business value, not command line interface, not any code, but showcasing the business value. And the video had to be a minimum of three minutes. And since we were performance testing the platform, we said that they must have also deployed it at least three times 
from dev test into production. We ran eight social experiments, all ranging from adoption of the platform to how quickly they could learn, entrepreneurship, um, collaboration, how much discomfort people can get, how much they can self-learn, who are the change agents or the people who will rally around this and who will cheer for this, um, and psychological safety. Uh, we had a number of functional experiments where we were capturing the data, actual fire drills for our platform operators, and we also wanted to change the behavior, right? This was in the same organization where it was 183 days concept to, um, to creation. And the mindset was that way. So we wanted to bring in that failure. We wanted to teach our executives and, and, and um, you know, be, tell them and expound the fact that perfection is like the horizon. You grow only when you constantly strive for, but you never achieve it. And so, there were 26 teams. It was, it was a great success. There were 26 teams across the world. Um, 18 finished with the videos. That was great. We had three patent filings through during this. That was amazing. We even had HR and accounting teams come in. We had lots of data. Um, but here's the most important thing. We had 648 commits in 48 hours. That was unprecedented. That was something that we'd never heard of um, within the organization. And then we had a lot of fun. And of course, we had pie. We had lots of pie in the celebrations. And my teams, being engineers, they decided to create everything from scratch. So all these trophies are created from scratch. Uh, we even had someone who had a laser etcher in, in their basement, and they etched all these medals. And then uh, if you can see on the rightmost side, we actually had a prize for the epic fail, which was to celebrate failure. And the prize for the epic fail was actually higher than the grand prize because the person who had the epic fail, they had to share this story of why it failed and what went wrong and, there's, and, and everything that they had to go through. So again, trying to embrace failure and trying to bring it. Those are the things that we, we did and it was great. It was a lot of fun. We tried to rethink and reimagine the way that we approached problems. So how can you crowdsource empathy within your organization? I would say start small. Identify some process or activity that you can rethink and reimagine to transform or innovate. Something that pain that causes pain and do something about it. Empathize with the people who are going through the pain. So, you know, put yourselves in their shoes or you, from their point of view. And then over the next six months, conduct experiments and track those results. See what happens. Um, measure your success see how much of uplift that you had, have a progress meter, um, announce it, share it on social media if you can. Um, you can use the hashtag lead with empathy. That is something that um, I post a lot of uh, um, things with. So uh, feel free to tag with that particular thing, share it on social media. Obviously you can anonymize it depending upon your organization. Or if you don't want to do that, and if you want me to uh, be the storyteller, uh, obviously anonymize, I would love to hear about your story. So you can email me at that email address and we can share the wealth of information and the goodness and the positivity that we get through all these small changes. And through empathy, we can drive organizations and get a better culture. Thank you. Uh, it's been great. Empathy is a huge passion of mine. Um, I really, really enjoyed sharing the stories of how we crowdsourced empathy. And I really look forward to hearing from you, uh, both on social media and through email. You can also um, tweet about it. And um, I look forward to hearing your stories. Thank you.